at, right on t at two, so uh, we got an hour. So we'll go ahead and get started right uh, right now. And uh, I'll, I'll keep an eye and let people in. I think uh, all the co-hosts have the ability to let other people in. There's a little waiting room. It says uh, somebody wants to admit, and then you can just say yes. Um, all right. So yeah, we're recording this session. Uh, the chat function has been disabled. Okay, uh, we're gonna have a, a question and answer session hopefully at the end of this, at the end. And uh, you can unmute yourself and verbally ask questions then. So uh, yeah, go ahead and, uh, and uh, do the intro, uh, Yago, and I'll introduce myself at some point and Autumn can introduce herself. Oh, uh, you have to unmute yourself. Oh my gosh, how many times? That's so, that's so funny. You'd think like by now, right? Um, so thanks. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I just wanted to say uh, hi, everyone. We really appreciate you coming out, making time on a Saturday to sit down with us and talk about um, a lot of these like great, great, great issues. Um, so just a little introduction to like who, who we are. So like my name is uh, Yago S. Kira, like uh, Kathy Kemper, like I'm, I'm also outreach librarian. I'm not sure if Anne is an outreach librarian as well. Um, I work for the LAPL and uh, I have the uh, fortune of like running Inchas Press and you know, uh, that's the kind of publisher that does the librarians with spine series um but only 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 with the help of max and autumn there's absolutely no way if, if you know me you know there's absolutely no way i could do this without you know like amazing people like max and autumn so um thank you so much that's that's what i do um max you want to introduce yourself yeah um my name is max macias i'm an independent librarian i um i have a heavy interest in uh, culture and information and uh, yeah, I live in, uh, in Silverton, Oregon. I got a killer t-shirt from New York, look. <laughs> oh, sweet, sweet, sweet. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's me. And uh, Autumn, would you like to introduce yourself, please, and tell uh, everyone who you are? Yep, um, my name is Autumn Anglin. Uh, I am the graphic designer and cover artist and um, general wrangler of all of this <laughs> and uh uh yeah it's just been an honor to work with uh max and yago on the librarians with spines and all of the authors that uh have contributed to this like i've been doing a lot of uh anti-racist reading lately and then reread our books and i'm like oh my gosh like our stuff is just amazing you know it's yeah. it's going even beyond anti-racist and it's it's showing a way forward at, for dismantling systems. It's the best. So I'm just excited sure. to be here. And we're really, and you know, the one thing I get, I think we just want to stress me, Max and, and Autumn, for everyone that's kind of showing up. And, and again, we appreciate you showing up is that we have never met in person. Um, so like all three of us, right? So like Max and Autumn live like kind of close enough where they've met before. Like I've never met Max. I've been working with Max since 2016 and I've never met um, Autumn in person and we've been working together since about that time. So like my, my point is, you know, it's really scary sometimes to kind of take that leap of faith with people that you don't know and that you want to work with. But, you know, it's kind of like something, it's just something kind of clicks and something tells you that this is going to be fortuitous. And so I just want to say that I, I really appreciate Autumn and Max for kind of taking a gamble on me and, and just really kind of working together and trying to figure this out. As you can hear, my 18 month old is getting hauled away right now by mom. But I, I just wanted to say thank you and let everyone know that it really has been like a, a thing of faith, you know what I mean? And, and I'm not a religious person, but I do believe in, in spirituality and um, kind of sometimes finding the right people completely by luck. So, so thank you guys. Um, if it's okay, I'd like to um, introduce, uh, you know, Anne and, and Kathy, because um, like myself, um, and you know, we, we got other stuff we got to do, man. We got babies to like babysit. We got stuff to like make. We got chapters to write. We have people to influence and we have people to love and to show the right way. So um, without further ado, I, I just want to tell you uh, real quick who, um, 
who Anne is, um, she's a social sciences librarian at Reed College, and uh, formerly she used to work, she was electronic services instruction librarian at Warner Pacific. Uh, she received her uh, master's of science in library information science from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, amazing program, and a BA in visual arts, art history, and criticism from University of California, San Diego. I, I did not know that, that's, that's hella impressive. Uh, Anne has worked in public libraries, academic libraries, and archives. She publishes zines through Eyeball Burp Press, super amazing name, with titles such as Asian Pacific Islander Abortion Zine, A Taste of Resistance, Toxic South Bay, etc. cetera, uh, Two Daughters. Uh, many of Anne's zines are about motherhood, reproductive justice, and the Asian American experience. Um, she hosts community zine making workshops. Thank the Lord that she does this work. It's like so, so, so needed and so, and so great. Um, so that, that's, that's an amazing um, venue for, for to show kind of like just people the power of zines and continues to organize with the Portland Zine Symposium and the Women of Color Zine Collective, super important. Um, and thank you very much for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, and then let me tell you a little bit about Kathy Camper. Uh, she's the author of Lowriders in Space Duh, Low Riders to the Center of the Earth and Low Riders Blast from the Past. Um, there's a fourth volume in the works. Um, as you, you should know, that she just won a super important um, award in Oregon for children's, like a children's book award for Low Riders in Space. And I, I can't, like, it's just. <laughs> it's hard for me for me not to think of Kathy just walking around with a smile because that's so amazing. So, so, so amazing. Um, so let me tell you just real quick. She has a forthcoming picture book, 10 Ways to Hear Snow, uh, Fall 2020, and also wrote uh, Bugs Before Time, Prehistoric Insects and Their Relatives. Her zines include Sugar Needle, The Lou Reader, hilarious, I love that title, and she's a founding member of the Portland Women of Color Zine Collective, graduate of Vona Voices, writing workshops for people of color in Berkeley, Wow, uh, Kathy works as a librarian in Portland, Oregon, like myself, outreach, right? Where she does outreach to schools and kids and, and grades uh, K through 12. She's represented by uh, Jennifer Loughran and Andrea Brown uh, Literary Agency. So thank you so much, um, both Kathy and Ann for uh, joining us and making um, not only volume one, like super special and just kind of almost like hollowed ground, you know, but just uh, making time today. Thank you guys, appreciate well, thank it. Thank you for having us. Yeah, it's my pleasure. I, um, like you said, this is our, our first meetup. I, I hope someday we can all party together somewhere, you know, <laughs> but um, better to be safe. And I also sure. have to say that it's amazing virtually how, you know, like we can reach out to people around the world this way. So that's always exciting, you know. Yeah, thank Most you both for having, for having us. I mean, uh, Librarians with Spines One is just an amazing accomplishment. And it was such a, um, like Autumn said, like the the literature that's coming out in one and two um, is just really hard hitting and so relevant and necessary for library information science scholarship. So congratulations, thank you. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, I'll, I want to start off with a with a question for you both. You both. Um, Go ahead and uh, please tell us about the process of writing your chapters. Uh, wh what are your chapters about? And what was it like working on the book for you? What did you hope to achieve with your with your work? <laughs> I don't know, Anne, you want to go first? <laughs> um, sure. Um, my So my chapter was called, uh, I don't even have it in front of me. I have the second volume. Um, uh, my chapter was called uh, The Future of Zine Librarianship. Um, or engaging zine librarianship. Um, I got it, was, I got it, it here. I got it here. It's my bad. <laughs> um, it was um, it was a project that I actually started in 2014 during my master's program, um, and I took an independent study, and I decided to do um, the independent study, a long form research paper, um, uh, interviewing and documenting the experiences of two zine librarians. One being Kathy, um, coming from a public library and zine librarian outreach standpoint, and then one being Jenna Bar uh, Jenna Friedman at Barnard College in New York City as an academic zine librarian who does a lot of community outreach and um, work cataloging zines, um, doing instruction with zines. And so I did two kind of long form interviews with them. Um, I think in the end it was like, um, uh, two two-hour in interviews that I transcribed. Um, and then from there, from those two in-depth interviews, I kind of tried to see what was the 
differences and similarities between public and academic. And what I found was that there was a lot of similarities um, and we wanted to go beyond the how to create a zine library. It was more so how do we keep this sustainable and how do we keep it going once the kind of um, zine librarian with a lot of passion is ready to like, retire what we called the hit by the bus plan. So if something happens, ca catastrophic happens or that person gets burnt out, um, it does the administration back them? Um, do they have other people on board? Um, is it not just a passion project, but something that's like um, kind of institutionalized? And so that's really important in terms of zine libraries. Um, and we just, I just saw a lot of similarities in both of the conversations. Um, and so it started from there. And then when zine librarians came out, or, uh, when librarians with spines came out, I decided to rework that project because at that point it had been a couple years and so I completely rewrote it uh, for Librarians with Spines um, and that was a big challenge to kind of go back to those interviews and go back to that original paper and then write something for publication. Um, and uh, so that that's been the challenge, but I learned a lot in that process of, you know, how to create kind of a long form um, chapter. Um, and so it was really good in terms of learning for me um, because uh, it's a different process than writing a paper for school, definitely. Um, um, so that that's kind of how I got involved in a nutshell. Yeah, and so I, um, I have a history of being a radical librarian. Before I worked in Portland, I worked in Minneapolis. And I worked for the Minneapolis system, which has since been taken over by Hennepin County. They merged the city and the county. Um, but I was lucky to be friends with Sandy Berman, who's still an activist librarian. If you don't know who he is, look him up. He, he should be the one we know about, not Dewey Decimal or Dewey. Um, but he, um, he was involved with the Social Responsibilities Roundtable, and Chris Dodge and Jan DeSiri also lived in Minneapolis. And and it was a very activist group. So we put out, um, we, we did seminars or workshops at ALA and um, made zines and did a lot of stuff like that. So um, I've had that in my background and I've been in other uh, radical librarian comp relations. So when I heard about this one, I was like, I have to be in that too. <laughs> um, but um, the, the, the chapter I wrote is called um, Low Riders in Space, How a Graph novel built a community and one of the things I really wanted to write about was how both my librarianship and my writer um, side were really both involved and it's kind of funny because as a librarian I I have to I can't talk about my book because it the ethics rule it's considered promoting an, an, a business and that's because a lot of contractors that work for the county have been you know caught um, <laughs> doing business on the side um, but when you talk about writing and and books it it's like impossible to separate them and what I wanted to put down was um, how I how how the two kind of fed into each other. So I moved to Portland in 2005, and as we've seen, both Minneapolis and Portland are very white spaces. I um, I'm Arab American. My dad's Arab, and my mom was white. But when I moved here, it was like, wow, I don't really have a community here. Um, and so the other thing I noticed was I, I was subbing originally as an outreach librarian and I go to schools and we're taking these white suburban books to kids. And, and you know, there was just this huge disconnect for especially um, immigrant and refugee kids, you know, like, like Beverly Cleary's great, but they don't understand or care about a lot of that stuff. So um, I, I had this anger and at the same time, I also have a huge anger at the publishing industry because it, um, you know, that was before we need diverse books. It was, um, if you were writing things, you'd get, you know, kind of a pat on the head and it's like, oh, great. So lowriders in space came from anger. And I've often um, laughed at people in writing classes. They're like, oh, what's your inspiration? And I'm like, think of anger as an inspiration because it can fuel you. <laughs> um, so I, I was, you know, I didn't know anyone. I was daydreaming and I, I noticed that kids were grabbing the lowrider books. We'd, we'd bring free books to um, the free lunch sites and the lowrider books, we couldn't keep them, you know, there. And they were all nonfiction books like photo, um, photos and kind of descriptions. And I started daydreaming like what 
what, what would a story be? And then kind of the name Lowriders in Space came into my head and that just resonated. So I was walking around with this in my head for a long time, daydreaming. And then um, um, Lowrider Magazine brought their Lowrider show to Portland. And, and they don't do this anymore because it's too expensive. I think now they just maybe go to Las Vegas and a few other sites. But they used to go everywhere from Seattle down through California, through um, the southeast and Georgia to Florida. And um, they didn't go to the Midwest, but there's a big lowrider scene there, like in Chicago and even when I was in Minneapolis. But think about the one place of the country I'm not mentioning. Where is that? It's the East Coast. Where is all the major publishing? New York. <laughs> so um, when I was pitching this book, it was right at the beginning of the recession. And I started a lot of agents I was pitching to would go, great idea, great artwork, too small a market. Even though I was telling them by, you know, by 2030, uh, English Spanish readers would be a third of the country. Um, and I'd go, I'd get things that would say not quite right for us. And I was always not quite white enough for us. So um, it, it was, um, you know, it was a battle at so many places. And I literally was feeling like I am so tired of publishing playing me, I'm going to play them. So I had a really good pitch where I looked at demographics and I knew from the library where this book would fit. Um, Raul and I met through doing zines. So we had never met in person, but we had a friend that was a mutual friend, and he's a librarian too. Um, shout out to Dave Kay. Um, but he and I were working on a project. He got kind of burnt out on it and said, why don't you work with Raul? <laughs> and so we were introduced virtually. And then when I had this text, I sent it to Raul. And he said, this is the book I wanted to read as a kid and started drawing immediately. And that, I want to say, is luck. So if you're a creative person, there's a lot of skill needed, there's a lot of training needed, and there's luck. There's just pure luck, but you can increase your luck by setting up the, the, the situations so that a lot of the other things are there. So your talent is there, um, but the luck is meeting the right person at the right time. And, and you know, everybody that, anybody that says, they, they didn't have luck involved and says it's all them, they're lying, you know. Um, but Raul, I'm super fortunate to work with Raul. We both had the same sense of humor. We love fart jokes and silly things. We both have the same activist um, grassroots. Um, and the storyline of lowriders is also, I think, our life practice, which is that all your friends and family that have skills, when you pull those all together, that's what gives you power. You know, when everybody's doing what they're good at, um, that brings you together. And um, I, I think like in our books, Flapjack Octopus is, he's, he's real crazy. He's, he, he's like ADHD and, you know, can never focus. And, and yet the other two characters love him and bring him along. And there's places in the book where you see that, that that's his skill. It's like, that's his power that he brings um, you know, whether it's humor or um, just that sometimes his, his out of the box thinking is what solves things. So, um, but, but what I wanted to say is that how we created the book is, is paralleled with what happens in the book. Like how they build the lowrider together is also how we built the book together. Oh, interesting. I don't know, we could, I let Max, cause he has questions. <laughs> What were you going to say? Go ahead. Go well, ahead. I was going to say that both Amisa and I've also been involved in the women of color zine in Portland. And so we could chat about that because um, it's been a, a powerful voice despite <laughs> like trying to pull things together on a shoestring or, you know, um, around everybody's um, little smidgens of time. Can you describe it? Because like I'm, I'm unfamiliar with zines. I I used to make zines back in the 80s, a long time ago, like skateboarding zines. I, I remember cutting pictures out and like like totally breaking copyright and like copying them in the, <laughs> my own magazine and, and wow. stuff like that. But 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 I don't know. Other than reading your stuff and and, and uh, other stuff recently, like chapters and stuff like that, I'm not, I'm out of touch with that. So can you tell us about that that group? Uh, yeah, the um, 
So the Women of Color Zine um, Collective has been a, a zine for the last 10 years. It was founded by Tanya Jones um, and Kathy Camper. Um, and it, when I first interacted with it, um, I literally, when I first moved to Portland in 2012, I, I think I Googled women of color zines and then found kind of a listing um, and, and ended up emailing the, the random email and saying, hey, can I... <laughs> Can I can I can I meet up with you folks? Um, you know, I'm I'm new here and I just want to kind of form some community um, around zines. Um, and I wanted to meet women of color, right? Because of the the landscape of Portland, I was in a lot of the comic scenes, and it was mostly predominantly white. Um, and so um, I ended up going to, at the time, uh, the Women of Color Zine Workshop had like monthly kind of uh, pop-ups uh, where we would, they would feature, you know, different artists, um, zinesters, kind of workshop kind of things. Um, and so at, that, at the time that was coming out of the PSU Women's Resource Center. Um, so I remember meeting up with Tanya and kind of um, slowly meet, and Antoinette is on the call as well. Uh, Antoinette mm -hmm. is one of the Women of Color Zinesters. Um, and so um, that's, that's kind of how I got involved um, every so often we would say like once half a, every half a year or so um, people come together to submit work around maybe a topic um, and then um, the women of color um, zine kind of comes together with just artwork uh, writings interviews um, different things like that and the tagline is um, uh, women of color uh, zine, um, how to live in the city of roses and avoid the pricks. Um, so for me, it's been, for me, it's been like uh, a lifeline because we'll have meetups in the park, um, birthdays, um, and they don't happen like often, but it's just enough for me at least to feel like I'm plugged in, um, with these other folks, women and non-binary folks um, of color um, that are, are very creative and wanting to kind of engage um, in writing in that process of writing and a process of zines. I mean, um, from, from the Women of Color workshop, um, I met um, a native zinester, uh, Kashina Doctor, who does um, Going Places zine, an amazing, powerful indigenous resistance zine. Uh, I highly recommend if you haven't seen um, read it. Um, but Kashina and I um, did Portland Zine Symposium together for a couple of years. And from there, we developed a, a mini grant um, to do youth workshops um, for um, predominantly um, youth of color in Portland. Um, and you know, so I think the Women of Color Zine Workshop for me personally has has really been the kind of that hub place uh, to form community. For me, it's it, it's all about kind of the community and the conversations and the gatherings that come out of it. I mean, the zine comes out of it too, but for me, it's really like that people interaction, like meeting Kathy, uh, meeting Tanya, meeting Kashina. You know, like it, it's all these kind of individuals that are really like just doing their own thing. Yeah, Antoinette. <laughs> Can you unmute? So, okay. Can I just like say something uh, off that too? Yeah. Um, I just was talking to, so I was a teacher for five years in Portland Public Schools. Um, I am now like um, disabled and, um, but still trying to stay involved with my last job was at King School, which is, um, it's a Mandarin immersion school. Um, it, the community wanted it to be a Spanish immersion school, but um, the choice that PPS made was to make it a Mandarin immersion school. And the result is that, you know, like when I was teaching, I had students who were like speaking five languages and amazing. So we had like this really great mix of cultures because King is a historically black school. Uh, there's a large Hispanic population. And then with the Mandarin, um, as well, you know, just bringing in all kinds of different cultures. And so I was just talking with uh, the principal the other day, because if I get disability benefits, I'm going to try to go back as a substitute teacher. But um, if kids are meeting in schools this fall, she wants me to come in and do an after school program uh, that focuses on art and history. And um, I am really excited to do that. And the first thing that came to mind was a zine to like work with the kids and like talk to the kids about different cultural like aspects, different cultures, different events that don't get a lot of representation in history. And the first th thought that I had was I could do a zine. I could have, we could do a zine because that like 
addresses different learning styles. Like some kids might want to write like articles. Some kids might want to do poetry. Some kids might just want to draw an image or some kids might want to do comics. So the nice thing about zines is like, you can te use them to teach, but also like have it be a really creative and innovative outlet. So like, I'm really excited about that opportunity and knowing like everyone from the Women of Color Zine Collective, like I had done a zine prior to joining that. Um, it was at PSU uh, at the time. And I just did that one on my own cause I was like in punk in, you know, the South, like in the late eighties, early nineties. And like, that's where I met a lot of people who were like actively anti-racist and, you know, it wasn't a cool thing at the time to be an ally. It was, they were like really, um, they got a lot of backlash you know, in the Bible Belt for that, being outspoken about that. And so it's, it's really nice to be able to be part of like the, the women of zine color, sorry, the women of color zine community, like, like in Portland, it's been a lifeline for me because I've, it's just been really hard, like living here um, yeah. with a lot of performative allyship. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's still going strong and it's a great, like, you know, people are still doing it. It's a great way to just mix different, like, uh, mediums, like the w upcoming Women of Color Zine. Uh, I'm working with uh, Uchinachu artist, and we're going to do a PSA um, for people who are self-labeled allies um, uh, and how to deal with, like, like kind of address navigating that now since it's become popular since there's a lot of protests going mm -hmm. on and people are kind of appropriating that for their own gain so um yeah i still there's still a vibrant zine culture and it's, it's just amazing and it's like such a good way to connect with people and if i didn't have that i'd be even more isolated in the city of portland so yeah, I hear that. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks for sharing hey, your project. Hey. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I'm so stoked. Yeah, I'm stoked for you. I also saw on Facebook and I shared it, there's a Women's Zine Collective in San Antonio and I'm spacing, is it St. Lucia maybe? But anyway, they um, they had this wonderful project where they made, um, they brought their art and writing skills together. And I think one of them maybe is a nurse and they made posters to put up in um, the, the posters were in Spanish, but all about the, the virus to say, you know, to explain about masks and to explain about washing hands. And I thought, wow, that might be something we could do with our collective if, if you have the language skills, because um, I'm hearing that, that for a lot of um, people that, that don't understand English and don't have technology, you know, a lot of what's going on isn't always communicated down, and there's a lot of rumors going on about, um, you know, you know, from the president on down about things that that you know might help you and stuff. So, but it's it's an example of how a collective can use its skills for the community and and for itself. And I agree with with w both what Anne and um, Antoinette said. I, I met Tanya at a workshop on the, the Women of Color Zine when she was first starting it. And um, she had heard about zines, I think, through academia. And, and she had done her paper as a zine, but she had kind of just her paper, it was just eight by 11 papers stapled. So when we came together, I said, well, I know how to make it into a book. So, so I um, kind of did the graphics and I, I came up with that sassy title. And at the time I wasn't sure if everyone in the collective would go for it, but um, I was holding up, we made t-shirts. Tanya got a, a rack grant, I think it was to hold a, um, a women of color um, zine symposium. So we sold t-shirts at the time too that had that and it has, you can't really see it, but it has a little woman, like a little woman with a superhero cape on running through these giant roses with thorns. So, um, and, and we had our, our little, um, 
symposium at the same time the Rose Fest was on. So I was walking through downtown and there's all these people lining up for the parade and I'm wearing my t-shirt. Um, but I, um, a lot of the original people have since moved away. Um, you know, there are people in college or, but, but I'm still in touch with them. Um, people like Hannah and Evan, and it, it feels like this deep, deep love. And we've had a couple meetups. Um, I, Antoinette and I kind of met virtually online um, and, and there was some other people just, just to kind of let our hair down and talk. And Tanya used to have those meetings at PSU. It was always Friday evening at 5.30 once a month and we'd all show up. And um, many of us, like, like I had an Arab community in, in Minneapolis, but when I moved here, I'm like, I don't know. And, and everybody was coming with that. So it, it was a very diverse group, but, but we supported each other. And um, you know, when I think of like, where's my heart in Portland? It's there for sure. And, um, I, I should also say that the distro antiquated futures has carried our zines. We, I, I'm talking with um, um, Tanya because with the virus, we usually sell them when we table and like the zine symposium isn't happening live. And so um, we, we'll see about getting more of the, the zines that we do have, um, but antiquated futures um, and then also Alex Reck um, at Buttonworks had asked about some, so she may have some soon. Um, and also, I should say, we won the Willamette Week Award for zines for two yeah. years in a row. So, and, and one other thing, our zine is carried in Multnomah County Library, and consistently it is checked out. So you can always look, um, they're starting to circulate stuff again. I, I'm not sure about the zines because <laughs> everything is um, kind of wonky, but um, I know it, a lot of people have discovered the zine through the library. Hey, that, that brings up uh, something related to, to Anne's chapter. You know, uh, um, her chapter talks about uh, continuity of collections. Somebody will come in and start a collection and they're all excited and stuff. And then they happen to leave for whatever reason. And then like, what happens to the collection? So ha has there been an uptake in, 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 uh, interest in in continuity with zine collections or uh, anything like that and that, that you know of that's developed since you've, you've written your chapter yeah uh, i can't speak for public you know just because i'm not in public um so the reason one of the reasons that i decided to take this new job at reed college is because they're one of the only academic libraries in oregon that has a uh, like an archival zine collection. And so uh, the kind of zine librarian or the head of special collections, Maria Cunningham, who's also um, a, a part of the Women of Color Zine Collective and um, does some stuff with Portland Zine Symposium. Uh, Maria um, has pretty much like created um, the zine collection and archive like out of her own like own passions and she came in there and she was like, this is what I want to do. Um, and she's, um, it, it's, it's a, it's a non-circulating um, collection, but it's definitely institutionalized. It has its own room. Um, students can kind of come in there and use the zines. And um, the the cool thing about it is like, once I came onto staff, we started doing zine workshops. And so they're small, but we've been hosting it and going into classrooms and, you know, kind of um, more and more professors are kind of picking up on zines as a way of um, doing that final project instead of the paper, you know, doing a zine um, or doing like a mixed media zine or something like that um but i think it's really important that that whole like um passion project it doesn't lie with one person you know um because then you know what happens when that person wants to move on um get a new job do something um and then that's a lot of pressure to feel like well if i move on then my collection or my passion project dies with me um well and, so and I, I, i'd also yeah. like to just interject that also it's a way that a lot of um, libraries get rid of zines is that yeah, they yeah. they take they pull the person's position or they pull the person out and then it flounders and they go oh these aren't circulating let's reduce it let's get rid of it so mm -hmm. um, that's where I've seen like there's a bell curve people especially younger newer librarians come in and they're passionate and they pour their heart into something and then suddenly they get moved or they the budget gets cut or something and then um, you know it, it doesn't continue so so I'd also say that build your groundwork so that 
you know, if it isn't like, like Anne said, not all on one person. So it's harder for them to just kind of wipe it out with one swipe. <laughs> yeah, like we've been trying to get uh, more of like the technical service people um, in the library, like excited about zines, right? Because we really need them to like do all that metadata and cataloging. And that's the kind of unseen labor in, you know, having a zine collection or having and so getting them really excited is really important in the process um, because if if those folks don't feel invested in that and they just keep pushing the zines aside like oh i'm not going to like put that in the system um or it's too difficult sometimes cataloging zines are it's pretty difficult because you have to you know it's not like there's keywords on zines sometimes you have to read a full zine to be like okay what's the gist of this zine or what are the you know kind of key points on this zine um so if those folks are not invested um um, it makes the whole process then kind of, um, you know, like a bottlenecks, basically. Um, can, I, can I just add how, how really prophetic what, what you and Kathy are saying is? Because like, I, I work for LAPL, and uh, in the last couple of years, they added <clears throat> a zine collection. And so now there's like six locations. And, you know, all of these questions that you guys are talking about, like I reread your chapter and, you know, they're, they're, they're super prescient. They're super like uh, kind of like at the tip of my nose, you know, and, and you're right. I think a lot of people don't like when, when you come into the dollars and cents of it, like I think I heard somewhere that it's at between 35 and $50 for in terms of work. Like, like work hours expended, it costs $50 to catalog a zine. So with a lot of collections, a lot of institutes, you know, that's like something that's really kind of important to them. Cause it's kind of like, you know, when like someone for, who's not rich like myself buys a Ferrari, like if I don't have enough money to maintain the Ferrari, I'm, I'm like, I'm on the bus, like when the Ferrari breaks down, right? So like, what's the point? So a lot of institutes, they're kind of a little um, hesitant to, to kind of like take on those costs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and, and I get it, you know, but at the same time, that's where amazing, super like amazing librarians like you, Kathy, like all of us doing this work, we, we come in Antoinette, it's like educators, librarians, writers, publishers, all coming together and being like, no, no, these are competencies, which are very, very important to us. These are literacies, which we need to make sure that people can can access freely, you know, if they want. Good point. And also um, to piggyback off of what Yago was saying, um, zines, like, like if you're building a collection, um, write a selection policy. And, and at Multnomah County, the selection policy we had is that zines are filling the space of stuff we're not finding in mainstream publishing. And who is that? It's BIPIC, BIPOC writers, it's differently abled writers, it's um, people writing about gender issues. And then we also had specific things that in Portland, um, like like when I first came in 2005, we, we, we weren't finding, like stuff on bicycles was really hot in Portland. It might not be other places, but it was something we would look for. Um, I, I also do outreach to teens and kids, so we specifically look for zines that we can share with them that, that, that will get by all the rules of schools and stuff. So um, if you have a selection policy, you can justify it. And especially if your library's putting out broad statements about equity and you know representing everyone and all that kind of stuff, you can say, this is how you do it. And we go the extra mile to make sure that it's there. And cataloging makes it so people can find it. The other argument I make is that zines are original voices, so they're not edited. And um, like, for example, I, I use this when I talk to kids. Um, one of the things I was writing was about a kid that um, gets super depressed and ends up in a hospital. But I couldn't find a mainstream experience about that because it was always written through an adult viewpoint. And then I found a girl zine about how she had um, ended up in a hospital because of depression. And she even stapled in the middle her schedule, her weekly schedule. And so yeah. everything I needed was there, but it was her voice. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that each of us um, feels like our voice is cloddy, not useful, nobody cares, but to other people, it's unique. So um, I think that in, in our society, we're, we're, we're trying to wipe out that individual voice and have 
you know, the spectacle, the, the mass produced. And so it, it's very important. And the other thing is historically, it's, it's a voice and representation of your city, where you live, if there are people doing zines. So uh, if you have a, a historical collection, consider buying them. For example, all the protests going out in Portland, you know, if people are writing zines about that, uh, 50 years from now, that's where the original voice might be. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, capture that. And then another thing, we've, we are not doing this as much, but um, hire, we, we used to have something called Zinesters Talking, where we'd have Zinesters come into the library and do talks. And we'd pay them, you know, a hundred bucks or whatever you pay a speaker. So that way the money is circular. You know, the money you're getting from taxes, from your, from the people you support, you're giving it back to the creators and you're buying their stuff so that the people in the community can read it. And I mean, to me, that's, that's one of the coolest things libraries can do, you know? So when you're thinking about hiring speakers, think about how can you bring in people and it doesn't have to be just zinesters, could be muralists or, you know, other people um, in your community. But, but I think that, um, that, 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 you know, we got wonderful shout outs and supports from creators because they, they said, we love the library because of that, you know? So, um, and you know, one of the things I was looking at in Minneapolis was when there was, you know, the horrible um, destruction going on, people in the community wrote signs and posted them on the branch library. Don't destroy this. This is a community resource. And, and, you know, that's what you want to create in a library, that, that the people you serve feel that. Mm -hmm. that that's, you know, what, what we should be doing. So um, I, think, I think there's a lot of cool things that you can do this way. That's such a cool story, Kathy, about um, wanting to find a resource for, for a teen that is dealing with something and then and realizing that the zine is the answer, like you can find that. I mean, so I have a story where as a zinester, a part of my journey was like reproductive justice um, and wanting to write an abortion story of mine um, and feeling like uh, as an Asian American person, I just didn't have any other voices that were telling a similar story and I just couldn't find it and it was so hard to find. And so while I told, I ended up telling my story through a zine and it took me 10 years of deep inner, inner work to get to that point where I told my story, but then the, the, the way that the community responded to that story um, just led me to need to, to do a compilation zine. And so I ended up doing like an API abortion zine recently that has a lot of work. I, I wanna do more volume to include more voices because um, a lot of the voices that I ended up getting while anonymous were um, East Asian voices. Um, so I have a lot of work to kind of include more voices. Um, but um, I was just shocked that I even got like 10 stories, um, some of them anonymous, some not. Um, people I knew that wanted to stay anonymous, um, people from that I didn't know. Um, but I was like, and they were like, I've never had a venue like this to ever, ever talk about my experiences. Um, and it was all through Google forums, um, but people will contact me and they're like, I need to tell my story. I don't even know how to tell my story. I'm not a writer. Um, I've never done this before. Can I leave you a voice message and you take that text and turn it into a story for your zine? Like it was so, the process of telling one's story is so unknown for cer certain, certain topics, such certain taboo topics um, that um, I realize that like zines are that format that allow for that, um, that allow for like that kind of community to exist, whatever the topic is, however taboo or however um, um, difficult. Um, and so for, for me personally, just to create this space for Asian folks, a API folks to tell their abortion stories or anything around reproductive justice, um, it was like so mind blowing to me. Um, well, and, al that and also that, that, that what we do through zines and self-publishing is as powerful as what you do through mainstream and the connections you make are as powerful. And I, I think kids today are being fed this, you know, American Idol story that you only matter if you're the winner, the one winner. And I always think at those competition shows, what about the thousands of people that are rejected yeah. You know, and, and it's just such an insane system. Um, whereas, it, you know, what you're talking about is you put something out there and you create a community and 
and you know you have this wonderful group of people that you can build on and Raul and I when we talk about our book we, we always say that we met through zines you know like like the community we met through do it yourself and you know not much money is what led us to a more mainstream thing you know um, so so never downplay that because also as you age as you grow up the, the people that you do murals and drawing, you know, and like your own comic books with, those can be the same people that you publish with or that, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, um, you partner with. And even like in this group, um, you know, all of us can partner as librarians, like Amisa and I have, have done stuff together. Um, so, so that, you know, if you feel that you're thwarted by an institution or, or by management that's holding you down, um, go sideways, you know, meet, meet the activist librarians, go to, go to conventions or unconventional conventions and, and partner because th that can keep you sane and it can also, you can get a lot done. Um, I, I really wanted to speak before the time runs out because there's something really important I wanted to share, which is about activism and everyday work at work, because we're seeing a lot of, you know, street protests and ways at which people are very visible. And going to a street protest is important, and but it can make you feel like, yeah, I did something. Now, you know, change will happen. But the problem is a lot of the real change is very um, boring and very, um, it comes at times when it's not seen and when you're not credited and when it's really scary. So what I wanted to do was I, I wanted to talk about a bunch of things that I did this past month. Um, and, and I'm not doing this to brag. I, I just wanted to do it, especially for other librarians that maybe feel um, you know, introverted or like, I, I don't want to put my face out there. But um, so some things that I did, um, there, there was a, a Latinx position posted at our library for three days and then it was shut down because of the virus. So it was up for three days and then it was shut down. So I wrote to the HR and the people in charge and said, you need to repost that for a week because if you believe in equity, you need to make it equitable. People weren't able to apply for that right when everything was shutting down like March 12th and 13th. So, so, so I advocated for that. Um, I advocated at, at our library um, we're getting a new person to run our marketing. So I said, we need to have diverse staff input into that hiring, like people writing interview questions or people getting to meet that, the candidates. And we have to hire someone that's responsive to, to um, BIPOC and, and diverse audiences, including kids, because um, that's really important at top managers, you know? And so I wrote a lot of emails and my, a lot of times I never get answers, but the point is I put it in writing and I put it out there. Um, the, uh, another thing I did was um, a coworker was racially profiled by cops in, in Gresham. So I, I wrote letters to the police department and to the city council um, and, um, they're having a big turnover. A bunch of people, like three or four officials from Gresham, have just quit their positions. So I, I don't quite know what's going on. But I spoke out when I when you know I heard that. Um, another thing um, that I would say is advocate to coworkers. You don't have to do it alone. You can talk to coworkers. Bring them in. All right, together. Um, sometimes I bring it. I try to bring in whiter, more powerful coworkers than me, because I know that their voice might be respected more, you know? And if you all push back as a group or, or speak out as a group, that can um, sometimes be more powerful than just one person. Um, share information, especially during this viral time where we're all working from home, people don't always know the politics of what's going on. So, so um, share that. And one other thing, I'm working with um, two other outreach workers. One of the things that I'm furious about at our library is that we only do Equity 101, and that's mainly for white coworkers. It's it's all the you know uh, 
white tears and white fragility and all that stuff. But where is Equity 202 and where is the room for people of color and people that, that are, you know, um, the, the victims of the institution itself? So I, I was so mad that we, I had to go through these initial trainings again. I, I spoke out and I, I said, I, I just said this at a meeting, and um, two coworkers and I are going to create a zine um, for co coworkers experiencing racism and microaggressions. Um, and you know, I'm I'm facilitating that zine because I want it to happen. Like, what do you do if a coworker comes to you and says, you know, this guy, this patron just said blah 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 to me. Like, what do you do immediately? What do you do if the management is just dead ears to a coworker? So you can back them up. Um, mm -hmm. So, so we're going to make that. And luckily, our boss has been supportive in our small work group. I don't know as it goes higher, like especially when it hits HR and you know legal stuff, if they'll shut it down. Um, one of the things I have wanted since I started at at Multnomah County is a space for workers of color, and I'm saying that broadly, to meet with themselves without a manager and without an HR person, and. They won't go that far, um, you know, like, <laughs> it's just so frustrating. Like, like they, they came out with equity training and the final training, you know, when you, you read like how the recourse they give you, it's that, you know, take a bubble bath, do self-help. And I'm like, where is activism? Where is activism? So, um, you know, that's, that's I, I just wanted to say those things to people listening to everybody you know you you can do this stuff and it's not you, you don't get a pat on the back and one other thing i'll say is look at your system and if they have anything that lets you write recommendations or write shout outs or employee awards do it for the workers that are getting shit on you know like i've done this for friends of mine where it's literally saved their jobs not just at libraries like like i did it for a friend of mine at uh when at Office Max, who did photocopies, and he said, "You know, I think I'm going to lose my job." I wrote a letter to the bosses saying what a great worker he was and how I would hire him. And he instead they had to give him an award of accommodation, you know, like the employee award. So use the system against itself. If they have that set up, and you have writer's skills, you know, write something for somebody that'll go in their record. I mean. These, these are just some ideas I wanted to put out there because they're ways of activism that, that you can do things that, that actually will make change. You know, I can add to that just one, one thing is like, you know, at my, my job, I'm a classified employee at, at the school where I work at, so I have very little power. But I was able to start a group and we analyze policies, practices, and procedures at the school for anti-racism right now. We're using it as a model to analyze policy practices and procedures for other anti-oppression, right? So uh, I think, and, and you pull in a bunch of different people, different people with levels of, of power and, and, and from different groups and, and, and get stuff going. We started out really good and we, we, uh, we uh, the COVID thing happened, we kind of slowed down right now, but, but you can do it and, 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 and you can create change and you, you have to push. And people will get mad sometimes, but like, I don't know, we got to do it. So I, I just wanted to, to open up for, for some room for, for some questions. We, we have a, just seven minutes left. So I'd like to open up to, to questions if that's okay with everybody. Antoinette wants to say something, go ahead. Yeah, um, it's not really a question. I just wanted to add on to what um, Kathy was saying and what you're saying about, um, you know, like things you can do in the workplace. Like I speaking from my experience, um, when I, the first two years of teaching, I taught at Skyline School. I was the only um, classified person on staff. Um, and I experienced so many aggressions and microaggressions from staff, from parents. And, you know, I had a really amazing principal and so many times it'd be like, I'd be getting, you know, somebody would say something like really offense. I got cat called at work anyway. Um, like, um, and you know, just having her be like willing to understand that what I was experiencing was 
not okay. She knew that already. I didn't have to explain it to her. Like she would back me up, but it was also infuriating and draining and took, you know, like energy that I w would have liked to have put towards care and education of my students to like have to deal with this stuff to basically like set up a meeting to have my principal say exactly what I had already said, but it wouldn't be heard by like the person who committed the offense. And it's like, so I see a lot now with, you know, the conversations going on nationally where people are like, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna, you know, make a point to hire more, you know, like, have more diversity in our hiring practices and da, 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 da. it's like but you can't just do that you also have to be like have a structure set up to like s support the people that you hire like um because that's that was a big part of why i don't i would say that's probably like 95 percent of why i don't teach anymore just because of like the co constant like not that I'm not open to constructive criticism because I am, but like just the constant having to defend myself, you know, my morals and like being accused of things that like, you know, and it's, so you can't just say we want more people of color in the workplace if you don't have the structure to set up, set up to support them or us when we get there. I just want to kind of put that out there. Thank you. Can I piggyback on that? Go ahead, please. So I also work. I also work with Yago and a system where like diversity is just thrown around, and that's supposed to resolve all the issues. And one of the things I requested is a BIPOC staff committee where we can meet in a safe space, where we can collaborate, mentor, innovate, and create systematic change within the program, within the system. And of course, I was the reply was we can't and whatever. But I think something wonderful that graphic novel creator Roxane Gay says is like, we think by using the word diversity, we're somehow contributing to change. Change takes effort. The word diversity is meaningless. It does, it does not contribute to change. Change requires work, imagination, and financial investment. And I think that goes back to what Yago said about cataloging. And it's like, we have a right to our voice too. We can be visible part of the community as well. Like LA is so diverse. 30% of the, pop, the US population is expected to be Latinx within the year, by the year 2060. That what is that population gonna be in LA? But LA PL is so far behind in services to Latinos. It's so inequitable. And it's like, I've been arguing the same point for 10 years. I had to argue, I had to request for five consecutive years if they would translate summer reading materials into Spanish before they actually did it. I mean, how difficult is it to get a translator? How big is that expense? And it's like every single day, I'm a, I like at every single meeting, I'm standing on my soapbox and all these eyes just roll behind their heads. And I create ideas that are stolen by my colleagues. And like, I can never get them past my supervisor because they don't respect my knowledge. But then this white colleague takes my idea and now it becomes a citywide initiative or system-wide initiative. And it's like, what the fuck, man? Like, what have I been saying for a fucking decade? And like, I'm so sick of it. And like, I have a presentation with the union coming up where they want to talk about my experience as a Latina. It's like, fuck that shit. I'm tired of being the token Latina in every fucking library panel. I'm going to bring you real issues. BIPOC issues are not BIPOC issues. BIPOC issues are library issues. If we do not meet the cultural needs of our community, the entire system is irrelevant. If the community is expanding with the Latinx community, but we don't have the language skills to serve them, how the fuck is the library going to remain present when Google, YouTube, all this other shit is there to take their time? Sorry, Yesenia, a lot of F-bombs. <laughs> no, Yesenia, Yesenia's, Yesenia's, yeah, got, a like really, right here. <laughs> Yesenia's got a really good point. And I just yes. want to say one thing. The community is what is what this is all about. I know there's a queue, but we're, we're forming community right here. And, this and is, I also, yeah, this I also just started. I'm sorry, I jumped the line. Sorry. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I just last thing. I also started an Instagram page, which is BIPOC underscore in underscore L-I-S. Um, and I would love for you guys to start following. And I, I want to take the information that other BIPOC communities are already putting out there and just creating a bigger platform so we can unite and empower each other. Because I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for mentors that allowed me a voice when my institution tried to silence me. So if we're not like the same thing about reaching people from all over the world, like how many of us 
have a community within our branch. I sure as fucking don't. So again, it's BIPOC underscore in underscore LIS. And I'll share whatever you share with me. I'll blast it out. Like, this isn't about like highlighting me. This is about highlighting fucking badasses like you that like make me want to be a better person and a better librarian. Thank you for the time. So one thing I want to say is like the structure, the white man's structures, white man's structures, and they need to be destroyed so we can replace them with things that work for everybody. Uh, that you, it's not going to change like putting some brown face in a position that was created by white people. That's not going to do anything. And people need to be talking about that because begging for diversity, begging for more people of color or whatever kind of diversity you're talking about is not going to work. We need to be talking about destru destroying shit now. Uh, and we're past that other stuff. Um, it's two o'clock, and we respect your time. Uh, do, we wanna, do we want to take Kira's question and then? Oh, and please, then we'll, please. Yeah. Go for it. Um, let's see. I just wanted to say I'm new to zines, and I also work at Multnomah County Libraries. So I'm going to be touching on the uh, workplace aspect of this. Um, I think something that's woefully missing in these diversity conversations is when you do challenge the system, because first of all, I just want to say the library world is small, okay? So you have to be careful about how you navigate it and when you make complaints. But when you do successfully challenge something and a relationship has to be mended, there is no work that is done to mend that professional relationship, even if you're calling out a wrong. And so I think going forward, as we're doing this work, that there needs, that needs to be built into the mechanism, not only for people of color, but as things are coming up, as we're trying to learn how to relate to each other, there, there's got to be a mechanism in place for being able to have the open dialogue to challenge, doing the work, and then repairing the relationship because otherwise you're just going to continue to have a divisive community and it's going to be oh well, I don't like this person because of this or I don't like this person because of that but eventually over time there's going to come a time where you got to work together again that's all I wanted to say thank you <laughs> So I, I think Anne needs to leave, but uh, we can certainly stay here as long as you want. I'm not sure what Kathy's timeline is like, but. Uh, I can stay if people have other questions. Um, I, I wanted to shout out if you're at a library system and could use an author visit, hit me up because everything got wiped out with the quarantine. And so I can do virtual visits. If, if you have a little cash, that helps. But um, I, um, you know, I, I also do zines as part of my outreach and um, as part of my lowriders presentation. Um, I also have a book, an Arab American book coming out, 10 Ways to Hear Snow. It's a picture book about a little girl that goes to meet her grandma and make grape leaves. And that's coming out in October. So I'm excited. It's a whole different age range of kids. So um, I'm looking forward to that. Well, I just, before I leave, I just wanted to let folks know that the Portland Zine Symposium is happening virtually this year, not in person because of COVID, but we are having um, two days of uh, virtual programming, July 11th and 12th, so anyone from anywhere can can zoom in um, and specifically um, if you identify as a woman or non-binary person of color, um, we're going to have a virtual meetup during that week on, on the Sunday, so keep an eye on that. Um, but yeah, I, I appreciate um, everyone coming by. Um, one of the stories, like before I leave, I really wanted to tell this story um, um, about um, like working with youth really fast, um, just because for me it was so life changing. So um, um, I got asked by the, they're, 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 there's a group called the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, APANO, that works out of Oregon. Um, they do a lot of grassroots organizing, um, policy work, um, um, cultural work, um, and they have a youth organizing branch called Ally, Asian Leaders for the Liberation of Youth. 
ally. Um, and so a couple of years ago, um, there were some white supremacist max stabbings that happened in Portland. And a lot of the youth in ally who are Asian youth um, take a lot of public transportation. And so there was a lot of feelings and emotions and trauma that was around public transportation and safety. Um, and at the time, the Portland Zine Symposium uh, wanted to host uh, zine workshops for the youth. Um, and so I went into ally because I'm a, um, I'm a part of a Pano and I was like, okay, as a, an Apano member and a community member and as a person that does zines, you know, I'll come into your youth group and do a zine with you, not expecting anything, but, you know, I was like, and so I created this kind of session a couple of years ago called Zine in a Hurry, which is you make a full zine in an hour <laughs> and you do the whole process. And I've done it with like, I've done it with like babies, like, you know, I've done it with Brown Girl Rise where the youngest kid is like, seven. Um, I've done it with youth. I've done it with elders. I've done it with college students. Um, so you have an hour and you basically, I've done it with academic librarians at ACRL last year. Um, so you give the people an hour and you collage and you write and everyone like switches off at one point and it's a time thing and there's a lot of energy. Um, and then afterward you you photocopy and you collate and you staple all together and the every, every all the participants leave with this zine in a hurry. So anyways, I did that model with the, the LA youth and the, the artwork that came out and the emotions and the writings that came out within this hour for these Asian youth was incredible. This one artist who I can't even, I don't even know who they were because of the way that they signed it. Um, but um, they came out with this oppression octopus and it was this octopus and each, and it had a huge speed, like a sword going through the octopus head. And each of the tentacles was racism, homophobia, transphobia, ableism, white supremacy, right? And this youth had drawn this like spear, like sword going through this octopus head, right? Um, and that was just like one of the images that came out of this um, zine, right? Um, and I, to this day, it is the most powerful zine because, I mean, this whole thing that we're talking about with Kathy and with walk zines, it's all about, um, you know, if you can't get your, your work in the mainstream media, if you don't see yourself in mainstream media, if you're not seeing yourself on Netflix or you're not seeing yourself are in the newspaper, like zines is the way to get that voice out. And for those Asian youths that felt so unable to be heard. They had voices. It's not about them not having voices. It's about them having the platform to amplify those voices, right? And um, I just like that that zine and that process of making um, these, that's why the community zine work is so important because all of these uh, individual students had a platform and then we took it to the board and we said, look, this is what your youth are feeling in this time. This is exactly what they're, you know, there's like 40 youth that are saying I'm scared and I'm being threatened and this is not okay and we're ready to fight. I don't know. I just, I, I wanted, it, it was, it was such a powerful moment uh, for me as like a zine librarian, as a zine community person that I just, before I have to like take off and get my kids, I just want to tell that story. Thanks, Anna. That's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for getting to hang out in a little bit of time. <laughs> yeah, it was so nice to see all your faces on little boxes and for everyone that's tuning in. Thank you. Um, thank you, Yago. Thank you, Max, Autumn, Candice, everyone that's involved. And um, I I'll see you folks later. I'm, I'm sure you'll continue talking, but I'll see you folks later. Okay. Bye. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, now might be a good time to say that uh, we have a call out for volume three. If anybody's interested, uh, I can send you the information. If you don't have it, we sent it out a while back, but um, we're kind of being a little bit more flexible and I keep, I have this mantra in my head. Like, it's like, I'm not a white man's time anymore. I'm not a white man's time anymore. So like, uh, yeah. So if you're interested, let us know, please. And send it over. Yeah, <laughs> Autumn. We didn't get to hear much from you. I'm sorry. I, I, do, did you want to say anything more? Please. Autumn is an amazing artist. She's a designer, and we could not have done a book without her. She is the also the sketch artist that did all the illustrations of everybody. Like man, her right. range. She's got her range is amazing. Everything. Man, she's amazing. So. No, I'm I'm good. I think you know. I I just think we should uh, hear a little bit more from Kathy about maybe kind of the process of of how the chapter went for her and maybe she can plug, you know, um, number three, kind of get some people the idea of what this was like. So maybe other 
librarians will um, submit. Sure, I think, I mean, I, I'm a writer, so, so I do it a lot. <laughs> but um, when you're writing something, um, to some degree, it's a little bit like a school assignment because you have a deadline and, um, you know, um, it, there, there's some things you want to say. So I, I'd encourage you to first just jot down notes um, and kind of, you know, if there's, like I talked about writing from anger, but if there's something that you feel strongly about, um, also to think about if there's something that you can share that can, that, that other people in other systems could, could use because, you know, I express this, but many other people did at the, in this hour that we feel alone, we feel isolated and like, what Antoinette was saying, a lot of times they hire one person and stick you in a branch or a school and you're by yourself. So um, I, one of the things I found with the Women of Color zine is that, you know, people check books out and they buy them and then that's how they become empowered. And from Women of Color zine, one of the cool things is the original people aren't all, all the ones that have carried it forward. It's switched over several generations. So to have that influx of younger, newer people, um, you know, you, we all have these ideas in our head and we can be sharing them. And, and again, I bring that, you know, forward from what I got from Sandy Berman and, and his biggest contribution is, you know, how do we, um, he's, he's been, um, forever trying to get rid of bad subject headings like illegal alien. Um, and, and he wrote an amazing article. And this was back when we had card catalogs. It was like, why isn't fuck in the card catalog? You know, and he went through all the terminology that's used for sex. And he said, nobody can find anything because the words we actually use aren't in there. You know, it's, um, and, and when you look at some of the subject headings for books, it's like, who the hell would ever think of this word for this, you know? So, so, um, and he's in his 80s or 90s, and he's still writing letters to the Library of Congress. He's still, he, he, he's not on social media. So he sends me, I get these big packets of articles from Minneapolis, you know, um, and he's always done that in his big signature, Sandy Berman. But um, he, he was one of the first um, that, that, that has championed this. And he basically got fired from his job at Hennepin County because Hennepin County had very radical cataloging and they're just like, this is too cost, um, it's not cost effective, we're gonna get rid of this. And they kind of forced him out. So, um, you know, part of why I champion him is he should be taught in every library school and yet we're still teaching Dewey and those, um, ingrained institutions, you know, like the whole institution itself, like the people there might not be racist, but if you have this racist system of cataloging and, you know, like the racist infrastructure, that's, um, it just perpetuates it. And, and even people are doing it that don't even maybe realize they're doing it. Um, another thing I was thinking of in our own, um, you know, maybe we should all research how racist our own libraries were in the past. And I was um, trying to do that. And I think the problem is a lot of the written structure is in meeting notices and, you know, it's paper someplace. It's not something you can just hop on the internet and see. But I, I started wondering that because I saw in Portland, they were um, talking about gentrification and they had these memos about, you know, at city meetings where they had um, signed off a lot of black people's property and stuff. And then I thought, I wonder what happened at our library behind closed doors. You know, what was our, um, and, and I don't know, maybe it was never written down. It was just kind of a, uh, you know, no people of color allowed and everybody complied. But um, I think that, um, you know, looking at your own library's history and, and, and making them confront it is, is another thing we can do because that's part of the healing of it. Um, but back to writing, you know, so start out and make some notes about what interests you and then you got to put it together and figure out kind of, um, you know, how long it'll be and have somebody read it, a friend or, or somebody that, um, you know, to, to help you kind of edit it and see if it makes sense. Um, I have a couple trusted friends that I have read things 
when I'm, I'm just trying to see if my ideas get across. Sometimes it's good to have somebody in the field and sometimes it's good to have somebody totally outside of it just to see if your, your thoughts make sense, you know? Yeah, um, can, can I say something real quick too? Um, okay. So I was also um, in, I'm Candace, I was in the first volume of Librarians of Spines as well. And I um, come from a different background um, from you, Kathy, where I hadn't written anything for publication ever really. Um, I do a lot of like writing from my library. Um, Cause I'm a, a library director at a very small library, but um, I'd never written professionally. And I wouldn't have even submitted anything um, except that Max reached out to me. Like I got a, an actual email that was addressed to me that was like, you should really think about doing this. Um, and so for me, I was like, I've always been one of those people where I haven't really put myself out there unless people reach out directly to me and, and say, no, like, I want you to help me with this, or I want you to do this. Um, and so for me, I was like, yeah, yeah, this would be cool, but what do I have to contribute? You know, like everyone has the same, you know, opinions, not the same opinions, but like, like we're all thinking about a lot of the same things, right? Um, how is my voice different from that? Especially as like a white woman who's a library director is like, you know, I'm going to be the white person in this. Um, but I, so I actually sat down and thought about like, like all of the role, the roles that I exhibit in, in my work and in my personal life and how that kind of plays out and like what power I have in the library and like what power I don't have. And I literally just like had a sheet of paper of all of these ideas um, until, and just, just kept writing until like one thing really like popped out. And then I was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is the thing that's like, like raising to the top for me. Um, and so, I don't know, that was like my, my stupid method, but you know, as someone who's like not a writer like that, that was how I came, came about it. No, oh, that's, that's great. And, and I think, you know, we're, we're also open to things like comics or, um, you know, illustrated work. So, so sometimes that, that's really fun to do, like even drawing pictures as you write, like it doesn't have to be an official comic, it can be like Diary of a Wimpy Kid or something. Um, but um, I, I think, you know, that um, it's, um, also, I, I, I want to say that, that um, you know, we, we need a culture of alternative librarianship because I don't know that, that um, the structure of librarianship doesn't recognize that. And when I was at Minneapolis, we, we wanted to unionize. The librarians weren't unionized. So we did a bunch of research because that's what librarians do, right? And one of the things that was interesting was there is no national library union. And it seems weird because there's so many libraries. Um, Ask Me kind of fills that, but Ask Me is really based for clerical workers, or that's where they came out of. So one of the things that became clear was the national organization, ALA, which seems like that's where we would find things. And, and what, what I learned then is that was set up for managers. So originally the big national convention, all the managers would go, and I mean, they still do, and they still exchange ideas about running libraries. I'm always laughing because traditionally after ALA, you know, if you know people working at different systems and you compare, um, you know, what's going on in materials handling or something, it's obvious they go there and share ideas, but there was never that for the, the workers, you know? So, um, We've never, you know, imagine if we had a national library union, I think that we would be, you know, be able to advocate for some of these things more broadly. But um, I, I just, um, you know, I think that by creating an alternative librarian literature, I can't tell you how many times I've had like younger people say, you know, either I read your zine or I read something you wrote in you know, one of these other books or things like that. So the thing about writing and publishing, I always wish there was one of those maps like the cops have where a little red light goes off and they're like, oh, something's going down. We all have to go over there. 
so that every time somebody read something, this little light would go off and you're like, somebody's reading Lowriders in Space, but it doesn't happen like that. So you publish something and it feels like dead silence, you know, unless somebody um, emails you or, or reaches out, but it doesn't mean it's not happening. And you think of all the books that have moved you, how often did you ever write to the author and say, you blew me away? Like never, right? So, so um, I you know, really- Kathy Kathy brings up a really good point, and I, I'm sorry to interrupt, Kathy, no, but ahead, I just want to make sure that I get this out there, and it's this idea that, like, there's this intersection between the people here <clears throat> and our lives as zinesters or writers, and, like, it's not a coincidence that most of the people here are either zinesters or have tried zines, right? Because, like, I, I feel like when you're in that world, it's like a method rich world, and we're just trying to figure out what works best, and I think that this book is kind of... Uh, like a, a, a pay on to that right it's just kind of something that was we're figuring how to do it and how to work it best and it still needs a lot of work but I feel very fortunate to have the community come around and then the and then the thing come after you know like something you talk about in your chapter with um, low riders in space you know so I just <clears throat> I just wanted to say that you know we're all we ha we all have in common the fact that we understand how to build things and like things need to be built and we need to make new things sometimes because the old models are clearly <clears throat> clearly something's happening because the old models are not working and they're only working for a specific type of people and that's fine for that specific type of people but it should be more equitable we should all be able to you know to have input and to you know benefit from that um so thank you sorry <clears throat> or you just you just you just remind me of something you know uh, Lowrider Librarian is always open to taking submissions from people. That even if, if you're not interested in, in writing a chapter, maybe you wanted to try writing out, whatever, uh, let me know and, uh, and I'll be happy to work with you. Yeah, and something else I wanted to say is that um, writing is a way of witnessing something and putting something in a record too. And um, one of the things when I first wrote Lowriders, I, I was really um, careful when I like the first interviews I got I said I'm Arab American and Raul is Latinx because I wanted to make clear that this was a partnership and that um, it's very rare I, I'm not seeing anything in publishing that recognizes you know two people of BIPOC backgrounds working together. Like right now, publishing has only got as far as like, oh, there's non-white people, so which slot do you fit in? You know, but, but I wanted to make clear exactly where Raul and I came from and that, that we weren't trying to pretend to be something or, or whatever. And so when you publish something, one of the things you can do is put you know, your own thoughts on paper and into the record of what you're doing. And, and we don't often think about that, but going into the future, like things that Sandy Berman put into the record, now I can go back and read that or, or future library students can read that. So, um, you know, it, again, you feel like your own importance doesn't matter very much, but, but it, it gives, you're able to spread that to other people. Yeah, can I add to that? And I just yeah. expressed this to Max yesterday. I said, when, the, when I read Librarians with Spines Volume 1, that was the first time my feelings were justified on print. So this whole time, I was like, I'm going crazy. All these microaggressions, right? Like, why am I experiencing these things? Why are my ideas not being heard? Why is this going on? And then I read these narratives of people who are experiencing the same thing. And it's like, holy shit, I'm not crazy. And um about speaking going back to speaking at this union meeting and it's like the amount of emotional labor that i'm putting into this and it's like i've already said my story a thousand times i don't want to talk about all the time about being you know i fit all the latino stereotypes you know my dad was a janitor and a gardener and my mom was a maid and i'm from east l.a and i grew up in poverty and it's all these things i say over and over and over again i was like why don't i just write it down i was like i'm gonna document it you want to read it there it is 
you know, and then other people can relate to my story too. Like my path to librarianship wasn't straight. I never thought I was going to go to college, but things just kind of kept falling into place. And I'm always recruiting BIPOC librarians everywhere I go. Not just my, not just my employees, not, but my patrons, my friends, strangers on the street, because nobody knows what we do. Nobody knows we have a degree. Everybody thinks we just read. And I said, look at it, it's a social justice position. You have the power to influence so many people. It's a two year degree. You say, I mean, if you already have your four year degree, UCLA paid me to go there. I left UCLA, I could have left UCLA with a profit. I, I managed my money more wisely, you know, but people don't know this. Like they have no idea. So it's like, I'm constantly like telling people all this stuff. So. I don't know. I, 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 get in, I don't know if I knew Yago before. I, mean, I had met Yago before I read Librarians with Spines, but like, it's like a Bible to me. It, I, I hold it so close to my heart. It, it's like an inspiration of all the things that are possible if you just kind of decolonize authority. I would like to just piggyback off of that. Um, uh, Yusina, is that um, story? Yusenia. Like Yesenia, I'm sorry. Um, like, you know, going to school to become a teacher, like, you know, I came from the same background too. It was like, you know, very in the South Bible Belt. Like, I did not see a lot of opportunities available to myself. I didn't go to college until I was 30. And like, but the library for me had been a place like that started my love of reading and like my exposure to like other ideas outside of what I was seeing possible for me and like you know I'm just now making the connection because like I have had like people come in to I would have people come into my classroom like I think Kathy came into my classroom I think yeah. at Skyline and then like um you know I would have like street books come in and we would do stuff with them and like um you know it's just like I was seeing so much of somebody was talking earlier about like all the stuff on paper that needs to be challenged like when I was going to school to learn to become a teacher like that's not how I learned to teach I learned to teach by teaching but my focus is you know they tried to get me to go for a general studies degree and I was like fuck that because I'm going to be working ideally with a lot of students who have experiences that I've not had myself. So my focus was the English degree with a focus on critical thinking, multiculturalism and anti-racism because I was like, there's experiences that I don't have and I wanna hear about those experiences from the people who are having them so that I can hopefully relate to my students a little bit better. But it made me think even more about like, okay, what kind like what is my classroom library going to look like and instead of ask like asking for graduation gifts i made a list i curated an amazon list of culturally diverse like gender like um you know all of it just all any kind of marginalized group like and i was like don't give me a graduation gift get me something off this so I can build up my classroom library because that's where it starts. I think like, I'm so like passionate about like working with kids and like having them access with the, have access to literacy and the library and like, you know, but like, yeah, it's just, we have, there were, I experienced so many people when I was going to school to become a teacher who just didn't think about it at all. They didn't think about, we had a panel in grad school and we were like, how do you, how are you diversifying your classroom library? And the person, I'm not kidding, was just like, oh, I didn't even think about it. Like somebody came in and told me my li my classroom library was diverse. And we were just like, <laughs> like ah, like, okay. Um, that makes it all the more important because these, you know, public libraries, public schools, like that's the last frontier for a lot of people. Like that's the only opportunities for a lot of people to like connect, learn, like, and I think exposure at a young age to like different, different stories, you know, is really what enacts change. And like, you know, it's just, I, I guess, yeah, I was just wanting to say, I didn't think, make the connection like, oh yeah, I was kind of a librarian too. 
<laughs> like, so, um, yeah, thank you for that. And like, right, you know, writing the stories down and just wanting to like get everybody's like perspective out there. Something else I wanted to jump in to add is that um, after the Max train stabbings, I was involved with something in our library. There was another librarian had set up a meeting of um, large religious groups like Jewish, Muslim and Christian to come together and offer something to the community. And I wanted um, a librarian or, or a library component. So I started doing talks, which I'm doing next week called Talking Equity and Social Justice. And I just go through about 15 new books on sort of that topic for K through 12. So I've been doing that live and it got huge um, you know, participation. But one of my thoughts behind that was by working in an institution, we have that reach of the institution. So, I mean, given that, that you know, there's all the microaggressions and stuff, but I realized that I could do a lot more by using the platform of that institution for change than just me, one person. So like I could go to a demonstration, but like by doing that presentation and getting those books in the hands of teachers and kids, like one of the huge things is getting over that, those, um, you know, barriers or gates that, that keep kids from getting books where they can see themselves. Um, so, so, you know, it, it was like the subversive thing I was thinking, like, how do I get over all these adults and get the hands in the books of the kids? And the other thing I was thinking is, if we can change the kids, that's revolutionary. Like, like even the white kids, if they grow up with these books and reading these ideas, it's going to make a difference. So, um, I've been doing that. And so this year, I was going to do them as video recordings. And then the county suddenly changed in the beginning of June and said, we can use Zoom. So I'm doing a, a Zoom meetings and they put it on the library Facebook and there was over a thousand people interested. <laughs> and I think it's limited to 500 people that can participate and you know how many people really show up at a meeting. But I, but I was kind of like floored. Um, and that's, that was for the K through five, there was less for the older group. But, but it shows there's a huge interest in that. And, and um, you know, I feel like if, if that can make a change. So then the other thing I wanted to say is that on the evaluation form, and I encourage you guys to do this, I'm asking them, how are you, how are you gonna put this into practice? The stuff you get from this workshop, how are you gonna use that? And I did that on last year's evaluation. And it was really good for us to read because it, it made people commit to something, but we also saw the breadth of what was going on in the community. Like one group was a nonprofit and they were using the list to, to purchase books for giveaways. And the other people were teachers. One teacher said she's gonna have a mirrors and windows bookshelf in her, in her classroom. You know, so by reading that, um, it, it gave me a sense of like, this is actual change that's happening. And then also it, um, for my job, it gave me some concrete things to aim my job at. For example, what do teachers want? How are they using it? How are they buying books? You know, where are they, where are they saying we need more of this topic or something like that? And um, I use the talk, as an advertisement in a way for our, serv our services, because I can't do more than 50 books, but we have more than 50 books we can send to your classroom, you know? So, so um, to think of it as a way to, to, to sort of show the library in a way that people don't always see it. And then the other thing is during the school year, I offer the talk to staff meetings at all schools and, um, since we've set equity priorities where I work, our priorities are to serve the most needy schools. But for this one particular talk, we will go into the richest, wealthiest schools because part of the goal that I have is to try to reach all those teachers that never would come to these talks on themselves and to try and um, jump over you know, to try to get, get a teacher to open a book besides the book that was their favorite 30 or 20 years ago, you know? So, so um, I think that, um, you know, to think about your motives when you do stuff and it, it's tough putting on a presentation and knowing that you're having multiple audiences like that. 
but um, the reactions I've had have been really great when I was doing it in person. I'm sad that the virtual talk will be, um, it won't allow for the kind of conversation you have. And for these talks, we invite parents too. So um, there's people from the community that come and um, I invite you to sign up if there's any <laughs> if there's any space, but we'll be sharing the recording afterwards. And I build all the book lists in our Biblio Commons um, catalog so that the books are all annotated and you can just put them right on hold there and um, you know share that list and stuff like that. So um, you know that's something else. But to think about the privilege or the opportunities that your job or your position gives you. And, and use that stretch, you know, to, to reach people that, that need resources or that you can, because um, to me, I felt very empowered when I discovered that, like, here's something I can do instead of just feeling like, oh, I just got to sit here and, and go through four year, more years of this crap, you know. And Kathy, I was just going to chime in. You should still do a recording. <laughs> no, it, it is going to be recorded. Or it is going to be recorded. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're you know, I, I'm going to apologize a million times for doing it, though. I'm glad I even had this Zoom meetup to practice because, like, when I saw that thousands of people were interested, I was like, that's not what I thought I was doing. Um, but, but it is one of the cool things about doing Zoom stuff from your library. People from all over the world little, literally can sign in. So, you're not just reaching the people that would come to a branch meetup. Is there any other questions from people participating? I don't know if anybody else has something to share. Yeah, so, if you uh, find any, any other questions and we're gonna wrap it up, but go ahead and shoot if you have any. So I just wanted to see if you would talk a little bit about um, your experience with us and our um, independent publishing versus like kind of your live uh, low writers and how you went through a actual publisher like how do you perceive those differences you know what kind of things um, at you know advantages or disadvantages do you see and then we'll be done sure um, so I think indie or self-publishing or alternative publishing like I said you're more likely to get the authentic voice so it um, will more represent a person and their ideas. Um, there's, there's pluses and minuses. So if you're, if you're going to try to publish, you know, mainstream professional, you basically need to get an agent first. And getting an agent is as hard as getting published because it's very competitive. Editors don't have time to read manuscripts. So they depend on agents coming to them and saying, here's a great manuscript. So if you don't have an agent, it's like you don't have somebody's recommendation. Um, you still can submit at some publishers, just send it in, but it's probably going to sit on a big pile of stuff. And, you know, there, it's a very narrow um, chance of it getting in just because of, of the procedure. Um, so um, you need to get an agent and then the agent gets 15% of whatever you make even after you die. So they are living off of your earnings, which means that they want you to write something that sells. So right now, like this month, black authors are selling. So, you know, you, there might be a bunch of black authors that sneak in the door because the agents see that. But, you know, next month, it might be something else. And the next month, it might be something else. So um, in commercial publishing, the dollar factor is really important. And in order to sell something, you kind of have to prove what your audience is. And we all know that a lot of white editors and publishers don't think people of color read, or they don't think that there's an audience out there. So half of your work is literally trying to convince them of that. So if you get the agent, then they send your book to a bunch of editors, and hopefully an editor will love it and say, I'll, I'll buy this book. But again, that's a whole nother uh, bunch of gatekeeping, of rejection, of, you know, waiting. People might wait. It might take you, like I just heard back from an editor who's had a book since fall 
just waiting for, for her response and then turned out she didn't want it, you know? So, so, you know, then, I mean, if you're really lucky, a bunch of people want it and it goes to a bidding war and, you know, that's where you see somebody got a six figure advance. So the advance is what they pay you to, to live on while you write the book. And supposedly your book will earn that back. Um, so if you get $100,000, they're saying that, that they think your book will earn at least that, and then you start getting royalties after that. Most kids' books never meet the advance. So, you know, picture books and stuff, they just, nobody buys them. So I'm, I'm kind of saying that because the myth of authorship, you know, it goes to that American Idol, like, wow, you're making all this money and stuff. And it's, it's a real struggle. I've seen people quit that said, this is such a cruel industry, I can't take it. And um, if you, people go into writing often because they want um, recognition. They want, you know, you want your ideas verified and you want people to see you. But in some ways the opposite is true. It's a very cruel, cruel, situation so you get rejection after rejection after rejection and and i i have heard of just so many um one friend of mine um who was a very well-known author the whole the whole imprint folded and she was out on tour and had no books to sell so she was out there pitching books and, and they they weren't even available you know um i i just um you know um there's a lot of in not infighting, but you know, it's a very small organization. So you've seen what's happened on Twitter where authors get called out and there's these big blowouts and stuff with social media. A lot of times the, on social media, people haven't actually read the book. So it's a pile on, but you know, at the heart of it, you don't really know what's happened. I mean, none of us know. Um, so that said, I think that doing alternative publishing, you can avoid a lot of that. And it's a good place to start because it's nurturing, it's supportive, you'll meet more people with like voices and, and it won't feel like such a slap. Like if they reject something, they might say, we wanna hear more. And you actually might hear from a real person. Um, you know, a lot of the rejection in mainstream is if you don't hear from us, it's rejected. Like you never even hear, you just, you know, you just have to assume that. So um, also publishing an alternative gives you some credentials that then you can take when you wanna publish mainstream and go, here's a bunch of things I've published and they can go read them and use them as a reference. Um, I'll also say that there are some alternative publishers that are very irresponsible that are that you know they don't have a lot of money or time so you don't always hear from them they can be flaky they can be you know whatever they want so that they don't have to have credentials or um particularly be nice people or train people in that area and i'm just speaking for the you know the the large um persona but um i i think that um I've always kind of maintained it, uh, uh, writing in both places because when one burns me out, then I can go to the other. Um, and, and yeah, if anybody else has questions about it, um, I, think, I think that if you're gonna publish mainstream, you have to realize that when they give you that kind of money for your book, it's not your book totally anymore. That's the other thing. You know, If you feel very strongly that you don't want someone in your space editing you or changing you. It's like they're paying you that money so that they can make a book that they can sell. So you have to make concessions. And there's a huge, a lot of, um, you know, how do we all get along and get this done? Um, and you know, you don't, you don't know your editor. It's kind of the same as working, getting hired someplace. You don't know the workforce that you're being drawn in to work with. So, you know, um, <laughs> you don't know the competencies of your editor in terms of discussion about race, you know? So um, you can find yourself in some narrow spaces. And sometimes it's, it's very weird where, you know, like an editor sends you an email and you're sitting there by yourself and, and they've said something that's gonna make or break your book about something racial or something. And, and you're like, should I speak out and 
risk that this is going to blow up or should I just put up with it? You know, and, and for me, I kind of pick my battles and go for the things that really matter and give in on some things so that, so that the other ones might get through, you know. I, I also should just say that publishing anything, even if you, if it's self-publishing your own little zine, it feels really great, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> I've seen so many kids get so excited, like, hey, I made this. Like, there's something about seeing that object that, that's out of you and separate that feels really exciting. I just want to say to Kathy, I've met you twice before, once at a conference and once at a, like a graphic novel convention. Uh -huh. And you are such a badass. I am loving hearing your stories. It's so oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, like, I was like, I, I wanted to say, come hang out with a women of color zine. <laughs> but, but we don't even hang out in person anymore. But I hope that we can hang out sometime soon. And um, I'm so glad that you're fighting that fight. And I know I would love you, that. Thank you. I know what you mean when you say like like I almost feel like at a meeting they're like, oh, here comes Kathy. She's gonna speak out again. You know, like I've literally <laughs> literally seen their eyes roll behind their heads. It's like I I can see you. You know, like right. I'm standing right here. Yeah, yeah. They know who we are. <laughs> And I just wanted to say, uh, we're going to have uh, some more events coming up. We're going to have one on the 16th of July from 12 to 1. And that's going to be uh, Miguel Warhez and uh, Gina. I can't remember their not last names. I'm, is, they're escaping me. And Rebecca, they wrote a chapter uh, for volume two. And then uh, the 21st, we're going to have Luisa Garcia Feeble. So, uh, yeah, so I'll be putting that stuff up on Lowrider Librarian shortly. Uh, and we'll be having some more throughout the fall we're planning on. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your, your energy, your questions. This has been uh, fantastic. I really appreciate everybody coming. Um, thank you, Kathy. This thank has been you, great. Max. High five. And <laughs> I, just to say, if anybody has other questions or stuff, just look up my, um, my website and, and send me an, an email or something, because I, I really want to, you know, share out to the librarian community out there and, and zinesters and stuff. So thank you. What's your website? Just so people know, because this is kathycamper.com. <laughs> And this, this recording, this is recorded, and we're going to post it either on Lower Rider Librarian and Hinchas Press, or both. I'm not sure yet. So um, make sure and check out Hinchas Press uh, website. And uh, thank you so much. Thank Take you. Care, all. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Awesome. Thank okay. you. Woo. Nice. Nice. Max, Kathy, this is Ricardo. Oh. Jeez. Ricardo, Beautiful. hey. Yeah.